Good afternoon. Uh, before I um, turn things over to Admiral Wald, let me just, uh, excuse me, to General Wald. I'm, uh, I know that uh, we had uh, told you all that, uh, that Admiral Wilson was going to be here today. Uh, unfortunately, we've had to uh, postpone that probably until Wednesday. Uh, there is uh, going to be a uh, session up on the Hill tomorrow uh, with uh, the Senate, and we uh, decided it would be wise to uh, wait until after that was over to do a public briefing. So we will do that, and uh, hopefully Admiral Wilson will be with us uh, on Wednesday of this week. I believe he has been confirmed, but I don't believe he's... Uh, yet put it on. Uh, the other thing, just uh, on the news side, I wanted to bring you up uh, to date on the number of aircraft uh, that have moved um, over to Tazar in Hungary. There are now 20 of the FNA-18Ds uh, that have arrived there. There are an additional four en route. Uh, they could arrive as early as uh, later today. Um, they actually got there on Saturday. Um, they'll uh, undergo a, a couple of days of uh, acclimation to the area, and then they'll be integrated into um, the Allied Force operations. Uh, the, um, uh, the Hungarians and the U.S. Uh, unit, uh, units that have moved over there are going to have a media availability tomorrow. So if any of your colleagues are interested, that is scheduled to take place at 1 p.m. Uh, at Tazar. And uh, if you need more information, uh, contact Captain Allen in DDI, and he can provide that to you. Um, this uh, deployment uh, brings the total number of Allied aircraft involved in the operation to more than 1,000. Uh, that includes 723 U.S. aircraft and 281 Allied aircraft. And finally, before um, we uh, continue on, I just wanted to make sure that all of you were aware of the fact that the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization and the U.S. Army have um, uh, scheduled a THAAD uh, target intercept test uh, for tomorrow at uh, White Sands, um, if the weather cooperates. Uh, this will be the 10th in a series of 13 flight tests uh, planned in this uh, phase of the development of theater high altitude area defense system. Uh, the, there will also be a briefing tomorrow um, by Major General Peter Franklin, uh, who is the deputy director of the BMDO organization uh, at 3.30. And uh, uh, so any of you who are interested in that should plan to be here. Well, if the test goes on uh, as scheduled and the weather cooperates, we'll have a briefing. On the aircraft totals you gave, Mike, is that the end of the line? <coughs> no, it is not the end of the line. There are still additional aircraft that are scheduled to be uh, deployed. I don't have a, uh, a fixed number for you, but uh, uh, we're still growing. There will be additional tankers. There will be additional uh, strike aircraft uh, added to uh, this over the coming weeks. The uh, THAAD test, is this a make or break test for a THAAD? If it doesn't succeed successfully hit the target in this test, does that doom the program? Well, uh, Jamie, I would not uh, characterize it that way. Certainly, we uh, uh, learn something from every kind of test, uh, and uh, it certainly is uh, is uh, um, a positive development when the tests are positive and we uh, successfully complete all phases of the test. But I don't think you can pick out uh, intercept as being 
uh, a make or break uh, part of this one. We certainly w need to have intercept, but we're still in the development of this program. And as I just mentioned, there are 13 of these uh, tests that are scheduled. So we've uh, got a few more to go. But I want to emphasize that there is always something to be learned by a test, no matter what the outcome. Yes. In Washington, both General Short says we can win within two months. What's the, what's the Pentagon's reaction to that, if any? Well, uh, General Wall may want to add, but I think we've said all along that um, what we're seeking to do here on the military side is to disrupt and degrade. Those are the, t uh, the key elements that we're looking for. And uh, certainly we view uh, what has occurred so far as degrading uh, the Yugoslav armed forces. We're going to continue to uh, degrade. Uh, the major factor that will be changing in the upcoming uh, time period, certainly in the early part of the summer in June and July, is an improvement in the weather. And uh, certainly that is from a strike perspective, a very uh, positive development. What you're saying is that the, the brass here does not totally agree with this position, that we can win in two months. Well, uh, I don't think it's a, a matter of agreeing or disagreeing. I think it's a matter of just indicating that we, A, don't have any particular timeline that we're looking for, other than the fact that we're looking to uh, accomplish these military objectives, and certainly the improvement in the weather is going to be a key factor in making that possible. Mike, um, for the last week uh, or more, there's been talk about uh, a number of, deser of desertions among uh, Yugoslav troops in Kosovo, small numbers and also a larger number. Right. But there's a report now that uh, Yugoslavia is actually building up forces in the Pesh area with troops from Montenegro. Well, <clears throat> first of all, the uh, reporting, I think, is primarily based on uh, press reporting. Uh, to my knowledge, we're not aware of anything uh, uh, visually that we have seen that indicates any kind of a major buildup. Uh, there are a couple of things I would point out. Number one, um, these uh, individuals who are coming in are not building up they are simply replacing what has been lost, if at all. And secondly, the press reports indicate that the individuals in question are um, what, what are described as recruits, which I think probably uh, translates to conscripts. So in terms of a trained military individual, I don't think this is it. Can you comment, uh, Mike, on the Newsweek report saying that uh, President Clinton had a, a confidential finding uh, that would allow the CIA to, to pursue covert options to destabilize the Milosevic regi regime? I have nothing uh, uh, to comment about those uh, alleged uh, uh, reports uh, contained in that article. Yeah. Yeah. But but you can, I mean, DOD has been, engaged, been concerned about defending against hacker attacks and, and has set up some machinery and bureaucracy and, and infrastructure for uh, engaging in offensive operations, right? I mean, that's been publicly known for some time, hasn't it? We, uh, uh, we have described, I think, in some detail what we do to defend. Uh, we have absolutely nothing to say on the other side. The no. British Defense Ministry claims uh, no evidence of any troop withdrawals from Kosovo. That's still the stated position from that podium. Um, I think you could uh, generally uh, say that. There is uh, certainly nothing that indicates any kind of large-scale withdrawals. I think what has been a part of the equation over time is some um, uh, fairly small numbers of uh, troops that have uh, come into Kosovo to uh, replace those who have been lost uh, or to uh, do some amount of rotation, but the numbers are very small. Yes. Do you have any information on Yugoslav Army uh, senior officers <coughs> under 
uh, house arrest, how many, um, who are they, how long they've been uh, arrested and so forth? Uh, I know Ken has talked about uh, some, uh, some uh, reports of that. Uh, uh, I don't have any further details that I can offer for you today on it. Um, uh, we'll certainly keep an eye on that uh, because we, like you, are interested in any kind of indicators that uh, this kind of thing goes on, but I don't have any further details. Any yeah. word out of the NAC today on uh, discussions of uh, boosting the K-4 force to uh, 50,000? No, I think that uh, you're aware that the timeline is that the NAC will be embarking on their uh, consideration of uh, some of the uh, review that has uh, been undertaken by the military authorities in NATO. Um, that is actually scheduled to take place later in the week, and to my knowledge, uh, the NAC did not meet today on that subject. An introduction in there, too. Well, uh, that is still a matter for the NAC to uh, consider. Um, and, uh, uh, but I don't know that there's any schedule for uh, that to be done. Yes. Are there any uh, uh, U.S. troops uh, training now for a Kosovo operation, either in the United States or in Europe? Uh, deployment. I don't. Uh, to my knowledge, there is no specific training that is going on for uh, that kind of uh, operation at this point. Uh, however, having said that. I think you know that uh, uh, that military units, in order to maintain their readiness, uh, uh, undergo a variety of uh, training at various levels almost continually. Those who are not in a, a, a status of being deployed for a particular operation. So I don't want to give the impression that uh, there is absolutely nothing being done, but on the other hand, there is nothing that I am aware of that specifically is targeted toward the mission that would be undertaken in Kosovo. Have, any, units been, have any units been designated uh, for? No, uh, not to my knowledge. Has there been any uh, prepositioning of supplies that could be used either for a, a K-4 type force or uh, another type of uh, insertion force? I don't believe there has been any specific prepositioning of, of uh, material for any kind of a force, but keep in mind that uh, we have in Europe um, a forward deployed component of the U.S. military. It's been there, of course, since uh, the end of World War II. We maintain a force of about 100,000 people plus supplies in that theater. So uh, certainly in, in Europe, uh, including in the southern region of Europe, there are uh, military supplies that could be uh, drawn upon for this kind of a mission. But yeah, nothing has been moved, to my knowledge, in, uh, specifically in support of that. Mike, can you comment on the growing perception, which has been fueled by anonymous comments from uh, U.S. officials, some fairly senior officials, that there is, in effect, a window uh, for the NATO campaign to succeed in producing a, a peace agreement, the air campaign, before serious consideration has to be given to some sort of invasion option. Various U.S. officials have put this at, at uh, several weeks to, uh, to perhaps two months. Uh, can you comment on uh, the idea that if the NATO campaign doesn't succeed in producing a peace agreement, there will have to be consideration of a possible invasion? Well, Jamie, all I can tell you is that uh, certainly uh, it is uh, NATO's policy, it is U.S. policy, uh, that uh, any kind of a ground force uh, that would move into Kosovo would be one to support a peace agreement. Uh, that's been reiterated uh, time and time again. Um, uh, we have made it very clear that although we are increasing uh, the air activity, the strike activity against Yugoslav forces, uh, there is no timeline on this. And uh, the strikes will increase uh, uh, continually in the coming weeks because of the improved weather picture. 
and uh, we will continue to degrade, to disrupt their capability to uh, function as a military. Can you comment on a report in Army Times today that uh, two weeks ago a Black Hawk helicopter flying near Toronto was targeted by a shoulder launch missile? And uh, have you had uh, any, any update on that, uh, what that might have been, if you ever found anybody, and what your concerns are about a CERB infiltrator? Was, was targeted by a? Yeah, it, it made an invasive maneuver to avoid a, a missile. No, I'm not aware of that. I'm not aware of that at all. I have never heard of that. But we'll, I'll be glad to try and look into it, but I have not heard of that at all of any kind of CERB activity in Albania? Uh, other than uh, some minor activity along the uh, border, which has, uh, has occurred uh, for weeks, I am not aware of anything that involves these uh, shoulder-fired missiles. That's not to say it didn't happen. I just have never heard of it. Yeah. Besides from uh, south and region of Europe, it was reported that you got a plan to move forces from Germany, Italy, Hungary, against Yugoslavia for your mission to repatriate Kosovo refugees. Could you please comment? Well, uh, first of all, uh, the, uh, the force that will be uh, assembled uh, to provide the uh, peacekeeping support uh, once an agreement is reached has not yet been uh, named. Uh, to my knowledge, it's not even been sized at this point. Um, so I can't comment because I don't know uh, where the uh, individuals from the, uh, for that force would come from. Uh, it is, however, not unreasonable that some portion of them would come from Europe uh, since we have a number of uh, military people who are uh, forward deployed uh, in that area. and. Uh, frequently are called upon to undertake a mission within the European theater. Okay, with that, let me uh, hold on. Late, late breaking news here. Okay, I am told uh, that we have nothing to confirm this report in Army Times of a um, shoulder-fired missile uh, being fired at a UH-60 uh, helicopter. And with that, let me turn things over to General Rowland. As we brief Saturday, the weather uh, yesterday was uh, fairly poor, although we had a, quite a few missions flown. But today it started to clear up, and uh, as projected, the weather out the next few days should uh, start improving dramatically, and uh, we'll start seeing cycles like this for several days of good weather with uh, a break here and there in the afternoon, maybe for th some thunderstorms. And once again, this depicts that most of the area will still be usable even on the 28th, and that could change a little bit, but good weather's coming along. <clears throat> a lot of questions about the weather and discussions over the last few days and weeks. Uh, if you look at the weather since it started on 24 March, which today is the two-month uh, time cycle from that point on, there have actually been nine days of weather out of those 61 days where it's been predominantly green, where we can fly most of the day through most of the fry and uh, Kosovo. And then there's been about 28 days where the majority of the weather's been poor. So I think uh, based on that, uh, what we've seen over the last couple months, things have gone pretty well considering. And uh, with the uh, advent of June and July coming on with the predominance of this changing from red and yellow to green, uh, you'll see a lot different uh, ops tempo and probably an increase in the uh, successes we've had. Although I think considering the weather, the success has been outstanding. Uh, last two days, 61 targets uh, hit. It's just ironic, the 61st day that wasn't planned. Uh, forces on the ground, 42. There are 30 fixed targets, 31 fielded forces, uh, three POL sites, some rad rails, uh, about 15 artillery pieces, a couple tanks, seven or eight armored uh, vehicles, uh, some uh, uh, sustainment targets, and uh, a couple of locks. <clears throat> the uh, humanitarian effort continues. Uh, as you've probably heard, there are uh, a large amount of refugees over the last 24 hours, uh, more than uh, in the past couple of weeks, 7,700 of those into the former Republic of Macedonia, uh, largest since 4 May. 
Uh, the World Food Program reports that many of those people were in uh, dire need of food. Uh, the Serbs have also released, uh, for unknown reason, 2,000 uh, male prisoners. Many of those males that were at the uh, <coughs> the uh, the uh, age that would have been probably military age. Uh, 500 crossed into Albania, and then another 1,500 are expected in the next day or two. Uh, Camp Hope is now up to 5,000 people, or will increase to 5,000 by the 24th of May. And then uh, Save the Children is uh, actually starting a school at uh, one of the camps. Uh, about 26 to 28 uh, different nations have uh, accepted uh, refugees in their countries now, up to 60,000 60, out of about 160,000. There's 10 more that have committed. They haven't started receiving those yet. Uh, you can see some of the countries have taken on more than they've actually committed to, Belgium, uh, the Czech, uh, Czech Republic, uh, and Canada, uh, as well as getting close to their 5,000. The flights into Fort Dix continue. Uh, 625 of the folks coming into the states have gone directly to relatives or families, and then another 67 uh, family members have actually departed Fort Dix, and that should start increasing over the next few days now as they go through the medical checks. Uh, once again, still somewhere between 1.1 1 .1 and 1, or 1 and 1.6 million refugees, 40 camps, uh, and those camps, as I said, uh, continue to grow, and uh, they are winterizing those a little bit as we speak, but uh, they've got. Uh, the refugee situation uh, at least in hand, but the donations are still required from what we understand. They need more food. I have a few uh, overhead images to show. This first one, Bogadzin border post. Uh, there are several border posts along the Albanian border that we have been striking over the last couple of weeks. This one here you can see has been totally destroyed. Uh, this is actually toward Albania to the lower right. This would be east and that would be west. Uh, nice Petroleum Production continue to take down their petroleum. Uh, it's all adding up uh, as we go along. You can see here about uh, seven tanks and a couple of support facilities are pretty much destroyed. That facility is uh, non-functional. <coughs> the Pristina Petroleum Product storage area in Kosovo, you can see they have some underground storage. I showed some film of that last week. I'll show a little bit of that today. And you can see they're covered with dirt. Most of those are taken out and burned. This one here had a a bomb go through it and it didn't burn, so it was probably empty at the time, but that's, those are all destroyed. Now the Pristina Ammunition Depot, here's another area that had uh, three major buildings in it and a, another support building. They have been totally destroyed. There's no more ammunition there. Uh, Sabat Army Garrison in southwest Serbia. This is the second army uh, support uh, facility, one of them. You can see several of the buildings there have been either destroyed or damaged beyond uh, use. The uh, actual weather as of 9 o'clock Zulu 5 this morning you can see was a lot of low-lying clouds. Uh, Kosovo area itself had some in it. That was this morning. That has started to move out. You can see to the uh, west, southwest, the weather is better. And I'll show you kind of a film how that's been moving along. This is a computer predicted model again. You can see it was pretty clear to the southwest over Kosovo. And that area had some low lying clouds. That's moving off to the east predictably. And you can see towards the afternoon area, you'll see the gray of the area starting to clear up. And it has cleared up, and they're flying missions as we speak, and uh, quite a few of those missions, as a matter of fact. And you can see it's pretty clear behind that, so we should have good weather over the next few days. Once again, uh, not only fielded forces, but his uh, infrastructure to sustain those forces. Radio Relay Site at North uh, East Kosovo. This is an F-16 CG with a laser guided bomb. You can see a power line above that, a major power line. Obviously, they're using power to control some of these. That's why we've been hitting his electrical power for his command and control. Another radio relay site in western Kosovo. These are all, today, all of these are F-16 CGs out of Aviano, all four, uh, 15 of the film. You can see under the cursor this uh, fairly uh, built up command and control site, a good hit. Uh, quite a bit of damage to that facility for sustainment. 
It's a petroleum storage facility in Leskovac, southeast Serbia, another F-16 with a 2,000-pound bomb. You, these are some of the ones that are underground. You can see switching is infrared to show that black or white is hot. These are actually under the ground. That one looks like it may have had something in it. <clears throat> Zoska Ammunition Depot. This will there will be several strikes on this uh, series here. This building here is the building he's attacking. There are several buildings in this area. I want you to take a look at this building because it's the last time anybody will see it. And there was quite a bit of ammunition in that. This is another hit on the same area. This used to be a building. He's going after this one here. Uh, and after the weeks we've seen these films, the ammunition, and this is another one that had quite a bit of ammunition in it. He's really being degraded for his long-term sustainment and his near-term sustainment for that matter. Another one in the same area, third strike, different part of the uh, complex. Once again, many of these buildings have quite a bit of ammunition in them. That one, probably not quite as much, but still some secondary from it, as you can see the burning. His integrated air defense is being taken down to the point where they're still firing SAM sometimes with guidance. This is a low-blow SA-3 radar, one of the strategic type SAMs. We've taken several of these down. You see an F-16 here attacking it. And this uh, is not a dummy, as you'll see. This will run for a while. It obviously had missiles with it. You can see the missiles going off. It hasn't ended yet. Those are SA-3 SAMs. You can see it's, uh, if that's a decoy, he's putting a lot of money into decoys. It's a low-blow SA-3 radar at the same site. You can see the lower right of this film where it's still burning from the last one I just showed. And then the radar itself here will be attacked. Uh, once again, unlikely that's a decoy. Uh, the SAMs and SAM radar. Uh, we have not seen any evidence whatsoever of that. Now, he has husband and sub of his radars, uh, as you know, Ivan, but no resupply that we know of. How many missiles do you think that was just that we saw cooking off? Wait, there? Let's talk uh, about after the That was right. probably two or three. This is a uh, AN-2 Colt. They uh, found three of those in the, uh, two days ago. That one was uh, had quite a bit of fuel in it, it looks like. That was formerly an AN-2 Colt. Here's another one that had been damaged earlier. Uh, but was not destroyed. You can see a couple of those. And we're not sure what that was hit from before, but uh, we take this one out. And that one obviously had some fuel in it. That's a large explosion. May have had ammunition in it for all we know. Uh, armored personnel carry in a revetment in southeast Kosovo. And as the weather gets good and we get more airplanes in there, uh, this will be more prevalent where wherever he moves uh, it will be very difficult for him to get away from any type of attack. There's one that was hit up earlier. That one had a large explosion with it. This is another one, revetted artillery. F-16, you can see that they're putting their artillery along the border areas in, our, in revetments. And it's going to be very difficult for him to field any type of force out there or get it out in the open where he can operate. Another revetted artillery, second strike, same type of area. You see the first strike. It's hard for him to shoot artillery from caves or under the ground, so if he's going to do anything with it, he's got to get out in the open someplace, and when they do, we'll find him. That one looked like it may have missed by about five feet, but probably had some damage on it. Tank in north central Kosovo with an F 16 again, LGB. Lots of uh, evidence of movement around there. It's very hard to drive a tank around without making some kind of something on the ground to show it. Another tank, same area. Three strike above it. And there's been a lot of discussion about decoys. If they're going to make decoys, they've got to get out in the open to make decoys. So as they get out in the open and we find them, we'll just destroy what they're doing at that time. I believe that's all the film for today. Is there any questions from anybody? We wanted to go back and ask you a little bit about that one, that one video where we saw the SA-3 missiles corkscrewing off. 
Uh, were those, did it appear that the missiles had been fired uh, just prior to the strike, or were they fired as reaction to the strike, or did they just simply go off? They, they cooked off from the explosion from the, from the bombs, same way the SA-6 uh, showed a couple days ago. And uh, they're trying almost anything they can do to uh, attack the aircraft. They're using all types of methodologies. They're very good at uh, workarounds and uh, some things that are not so traditional. Uh, but when we find him, we'll destroy him, and his, uh, the majority of his SA-3s are destroyed, and a large chunk of his SA-6s have been taken out. He still has quite a few SAMs. He's had a, uh, several thousand surface-to-air missiles uh, in the inventory, but what he really needs to be effective are the radars. So as we get the radars, it'll become more and more difficult for him to become effective with the SAMs. But he still has some capability, and, uh, but as I said earlier, we'll take uh, all of his radars down eventually, and uh, he's just going to have to start defending himself with a, a more rudimentary fashion. General Wald, uh, regarding the artillery uh, emplacement along the borders uh, and other, there was a report that there was some reinforcement coming in uh, from Serbia and into Kosovo of the VJ. Uh, could, could you comment as to whether, in fact, uh, there is a buildup uh, along the borders to, re, uh, 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 let's say, to resist? Uh, any of NATO ground forces that might come against them? Are they, in fact, building up their borders in expectation of war with NATO? No, I, I don't know if he is building it up in expectation of anything like that, but uh, I think he's probably wondering what's happening about now. And I'm not sure he knows exactly what's going to happen to him next. So I suspect he's building up his forces along the border in response possibly to the UCK as well. Uh, as we said last week, the UCK is growing. Uh, I think he, you know, this is a zero-sum game for him. Uh, when, he, when we destroy something, he doesn't get it back anymore. So if they move forces in, if they're able to, from northern Fry into Kosovo, that takes forces away from the central, his Fry forces up north, either the first or second army. But he doesn't have any replacements. He may get some recruits, but there are raw recruits that aren't trained up. He has very, uh, he has, uh, we haven't seen no evidence of him getting any new SAM equipment, uh, particularly strategic type SAMs. I mean, he may be able to smuggle in some smaller ones. We don't see any evidence of him resupplying his uh, tanks, his artillery with new equipment. Uh, he isn't able to build new refineries. He isn't able to build new ammunition storage uh, production or storage areas. He isn't able to build new trucks. He isn't able to repair his vehicles very well. He has a very limited capability to even sub to uh, repair the SAMs as they, because they move them around a lot, they need repair. So he has a zero-sum game, and his sum is going down fast. So he probably is becoming a little bit defensive in his own mind. Uh, of course, he wouldn't admit that publicly, but I think uh, once he gets the real story, and I think, once again, probably the only place he really gets it is from briefings like this, he has to start wondering what, uh, what, where he's going. A couple of logistical questions following up on that, uh, just, just so that uh, so we can understand here. Um, there are indications, at least news reports, that troops, if nothing else, are getting into Kosovo. And presumably the uh, Yugoslav army is also receiving at least some measure of supplies, food or whatever, or we'd probably be hearing about that. Can you give a sense of how uh, the Yugoslavs have been able to do that in light of all the pictures we've seen of bridges blowing and, and rail lines well, blowing? Well, it's very easy for people to walk. And I think they're probably moving along on either a very uh, small secondary roads or who knows, they could be marching in for that matter. Uh, marching in with troops without equipment uh, probably makes them feel good from the number standpoint, but it doesn't make them effective from the standpoint of a very sophisticated military. Uh, as far as supplies, I'm sure they've had quite a few supplies in the area that they'd had there before. Uh, they're foraging uh, off the land. They're stealing the IDP's food. Uh, so they could probably sustain from that perspective for a period of time. They uh, haven't moved around a lot of their equipment for a long period of time, so they're husbanding their fuel, uh, but they are having to share fuel with other type vehicles. I'm sure they're stealing the fuel out of the vehicles that were left in Kosovo. Uh, they're not to the point where they're not effective from the standpoint of surviving. But uh, once again, uh, I doubt very seriously if he's not taking a serious hit on his ability to sustain uh, and once again, those troops that come in, that's a zero-sum game because the troops, if they are coming in from the north, uh, basically decrease the capability up there that he might need to defend himself at some point, for all I know. 
And some of the other troops, the newer ones, the recruits, are probably not very effective from the standpoint of being trained up. So uh, I'm sure that there's a lot of people wondering why hasn't he dropped off the edge of the earth on this thing. Uh, and I'm not sure why he hasn't stopped either. That's his problem. But the fact of the matter is, a zero-sum game, he is being degraded, which is the military mission. I mean, if you start from day one, the first time we bombed him, we were starting to affect the military mission. Uh, and our military mission is being successful to degrade and destroy his capability. Uh, that's, you can't argue against that. General, General, the, uh, uh, General Lieutenant General Short gave the Washington Post an assessment that, uh, that this war might be over in, within two months. Uh, is that the view of the Pentagon, and, or is that General Short's personal uh, assessment, and do you share that opinion? Well, I, I, that's, pers that's General Short's opinion. I think uh, everybody can speak for themselves. The fact of the matter is, I just went through, uh, my personal opinion is that Milosevic's military is being degraded significantly. Uh, and it's not linear. It's starting to add up quite a bit. Uh, you could argue that over the next couple of months, uh, the weather will be good. Uh, Captain Doubleday just mentioned some more aircraft arrived over the weekend. Uh, there are others to arrive. Uh, I, there isn't any timetable set for anything here. The, the mission itself, once again, is to degrade and destroy his military capability. The longer he holds out and doesn't meet NATO's conditions, the more of his military will be destroyed. So uh, I would say from day one we've been successful from that perspective. You attacked uh, over the weekend the uh, power generating capacity. Did you destroy two major plants? How many do they have left? On power production? Power generating. We haven't attacked any of their plants per se. We've attacked their switching stations and their ability to move the electricity. Was it strictly transmission then over yes. the weekend? What an implication that they actually attacked uh, Generating station. No, we have not attacked his ability to generate electricity. We've at attacked his ability to move it to places that, that are needed. General, uh, two questions along the line of, of Jamie's there. Uh, I understand you say there's no timeline. You have not set, you know, 1 August as, as the date by which uh, you'll, you'll, you'll right. one victory or you'll f feel you failed in some way. Uh, the general, uh, was, general Charles was making a prediction. He wasn't saying that it, it was simply a prediction. So. Is it, does the Pentagon share in this prediction? That, and what he said, he didn't, I don't think he ever used the words when, according to the article. He actually said that they will need to be destroyed or they will have left Kosovo. I mean, that's tantamount to winning. But does the Pentagon uh, share his prediction without saying there's a timeline on this? And two, is there kind of a later timeline? What's the timeline, not for a ground invasion, but for simply taking the Kosovars in with a peacekeeping force under uh, permissive conditions? And because because of winter, is there a, at what point in the year can you simply not take the Kosovars in? Because well, I think, let me answer the last one first. Uh, militarily, I think anybody would rather operate in good weather conditions, but we operate in all kinds of conditions. I mean, we fly year round. We operate on the ground year round. We operate. We have people that are trained for winter weather. Uh, we have the 10 mouth, 10th Mountain Division, I believe it is, that are trained to do that type of thing. So, once again, my personal opinion is I think we make a little bit too much of this weather uh, issue from the standpoint of snow or not. Uh, on the first part, whether or not General Short, uh, the Pentagon, agrees with him or not, he's, he's a commander in the field. I haven't heard General Shelton or anybody else put a timeline on this thing. Uh, I think he's voicing his opinion from a JFAC position that uh, at a, over a period of time, if we continue as we're doing uh, with the weather the way it's going to be, it would be very hard to figure what type of military capability you'll have at that time. But uh, I don't think anybody's putting any time limit on anything. The objective is to destroy his military. If he wants to come out and form up in a large group and let us destroy him quicker, that would be better. But uh, I think as he goes down the road and loses more and more, he'll be even more careful, but that makes him ineffective. He's got another equation to think about, and that's the UCK as they grow stronger. So timelines are difficult, but uh, degradation of the forces are easy. Let me try that in another way. In two months, what is your assessment of how militarily effective a force he will have in Kosovo? Well, let me tell you how I think he is today. Uh, I think his military force, uh, from a professional military standpoint, uh, is not professional. I think anybody that put up with the fact that they have a leader like that that will allow that to happen can't be categorized as professional. Can they kill innocent people? Yes. Can they shoot at uh, aircraft? Yes. Can they fight the UCK back? Yes. Uh, but I have a tough time claiming they're professional. So uh, I don't have any timeline of when they're going to get to the point where they think uh, they're destroyed enough to quit. Uh, they have a different ethos than our US military does, or NATO for that matter. 
but uh, our mission is to continue to destroy him. We will do that over time. It will get worse over the next couple months. Uh, Milosevic and his military are going to have to decide when enough is enough. I think the, the, uh, the focus on timelines grows out of the debate about whether or not there should be an air campaign last, I guess it was late last summer, early last fall, when the, 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 the motivation for, the, for uh, threatening Milosevic with, with an air campaign was that if, if if action, effective action wasn't taken soon, that there would be humanitarian disaster, that refugees would starve and freeze in the, in the snow in the mountains. And, it, the, you know, that we're, we will eventually get into that cycle again. And the, we've seen that it's taken, you know, weeks and, uh, and considerable effort to move 5,000 troops and 24 helicopters from Germany to, to Albania. So with those things in mind, it, it kind of raises the question of, it seems like it would take a long time to get a significant force there, and it seems like there are time constraints. I don't think anybody questions that the mili U.S. military could operate in, in the snow, but I think everyone questions whether barefoot refugees could operate in the snow. I agree. The fact of the matter is, what can... What, what's, what, what are the time constraints that... I mean, are you under a significant time pressure to get this job done? Well, no, we're not under any significant time pressure from anybody. Uh, besides the fact we want to succeed, which we are succeeding, uh, the fact of the matter is we haven't committed to anything besides a peacekeeping force in Kosovo. So that's what the plan is. Now, it isn't just the air campaign that's going on. There's a lot of diplomacy that's going on. The air campaign and the military mission is only one part of this. So that will continue down the road. Uh, once again, the spring thaw is bar barely completed in uh, Kosovo. Uh, not to say that uh, we're not interested in having this end. <clears throat> on the other hand, we're committed. So Milosevic is going to have to make his mind up at some point here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, on the upcoming military build-up in Skopje for the repatriation of the Kosovo refugees to their homes in Kosovo, do you have any problem with the Greek government for the use of the city of Thessaloniki and the sea lines and the air corridors of the Aegean Sea? Otherwise, did you reach any agreement with the Greek government in order to avoid any problem in your contingency plan? Uh, as far as the Greek government is concerned, they're part of NATO, and we haven't heard any problem with us moving in a peacekeeping force through Thessaloniki whatsoever. Even though you and others at that podium have said that there's no deal with the KLA, as uh, NATO continues to take out the tanks and artillery <coughs> and armored personnel carriers, this is obviously aiding the KLA, which does not have armor and heavy artillery. And over the weekend, a spokesman for the KLA announced that uh, they would not sign any kind of a peace treaty unless they got independence. Are we creating a catch-22 here in the overall uh, diplomatic uh, political process taking place in Yugoslavia? Well, you, if you ask me, it's an opinion, so I'm not going to go down the road because I'm not the diplomat here, so uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I, I will say, uh, we've all read it, they signed up to Rambouillet, which meant they agreed to the terms there, so um, I, I can't speak for the diplomatic part of that. Wilson, you're right. I think the, the consensus is they signed up knowing full well that, that Milosevic would not agree and they were dealing from a position of strength at that point. This may be a different situation. But you're right, it's not on your watch. And it's right. not your Thanks, Ivan. Uh, Bradley? At, at the beginning of the campaign, NATO spoke about uh, three phases. Can we, can we assume that with a thousand planes there flying round the clock, we are now into phase three? Well, well, I think we've gone away from those phases, but uh, each phase isn't necessarily the same length. Uh, but I haven't heard the phases used for a long time. We are in the extended operations phase, if you want to call it that. We're going to continue. Uh, but also, with the new aircraft coming in, more of them, I guess if you wanted to call it a phase, this phase will even increase more over the next couple months. So uh, it's interesting. We were through that phase period, but we're not into phases anymore. We're into extended uh, operations uh, 24 hours a day, high ops tempo, attacking across the board, uh, fielded forces as well as his sustainment uh, and his ability to uh, maintain that army in the field. And we'll continue to do that at uh, whatever ops tempo we can get with the aircraft we have there. Well, can, can, can you uh, give us some kind of an idea on the percentage of uh, fixed targets versus targets of opportunity and what special rules do the pilots have to uh, follow on a target of opportunity that might be near a civilian site, let's say a tank or an artillery position? Well, the, I'll answer the last one first. The, the ROE for attacking targets that are targets of opportunity uh, have been the same since day one. 
Uh, you have to identify the target. You have to make every effort you possibly can to ensure that they're, you're attacking the target that you think it is uh, and avoid any collateral damage that uh, you can. So that hasn't changed for years and years and years. They will report back and discuss through an airborne command and control element for various reasons, for deconflicting themselves, if nothing else. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, the first question is, just like today, we had about 31 or so fixed and 30 uh, fielded forces, so it's about a 50-50, but it all depends on the day and the, how much they're moving around. i got time for one more question. Did you, uh, did you rely more on cruise missiles this weekend because of the bad weather? In recent days, we haven't heard much about any cruise missile launches. No, actually, uh, the weather, even though it was bad, we were able to work around it in different places. And uh, once again, the, there hasn't really been much of a change at all in the weapons uh, used as far as available. Uh, we've watched some of them, as we talked about earlier, on the JDAM. Uh, but we'll continue to use TLAM and JDAM and every other weapon, uh, depending on the target. Cruise missiles launched over the uh, last two days? There were some cruise missiles uh, employed over the last few days. Thank you very much. Thank you.